I feel like that's a holiday miracle. It actually started on time. All right. Yay, computer. <laughs> Welcome back. Hopefully everyone got a chance to get a little R and R, eat a lot, um, and feel a little refreshed for our last slide here for the end of the semester. But yep, let me go check on the right people. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is to look at the rest of the semester because there's not that much left, which is kind of crazy. All righty. Okay, so we are here on 11.29. So today we're going to finish our chapter on everyday living. We're going to talk a little bit about um the perusal readings that go with that as well uh particularly the debunking handbook uh and then on wednesday we'll start our last chapter which is reflections on thinking like a scientist so that is your last perusal um and then 
coming up on Friday. Again, if you don't have it in on time, that's okay, but it means you're minimizing your amount of time for me to give you feedback. Um, but think about getting that poster in. And then on a week from today, you will have exam four. And then we don't meet for like a really long time. <laughs> it's just like the timing is really weird for our final. And so uh, we don't meet again until the 13th. Um, so kind of I'm gonna scroll back up and walk you through everything that's coming up due. Uh, Cause there might be several things you've forgotten about. Um, to do that so everybody can see everything. Uh, the psychology experience credit. Uh, as far as I know, the studies are done for this semester, but I know several of you participated. Um, even if you're getting the like course credit for another class, you can double claim the study for this one because you have to write a little paper about each one. So it's not like you're just getting the points for going. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to do the studies, uh, you can do article summaries. And I'm going to go over that in just a second. I'm just going to make sure I check out the people who are here on Zoom. I did last night, there was like two on Sarah. Oh, nice. One that's like on the computer, the other one is like this big. Sweet. So there is an option for two. Do you yeah. haven't done any? I used tomorrow in the last day to get the paper. So go ahead and sign up. And I'm sure the face-to-face -face person would love extra people. So go ahead and, and bomb them with participants. They will love it. It's really hard to get face-to-face -face people. So all right, so just a reminder of this. Um, these are to just sort of immerse you into research. Um, and so again, you can participate in the research studies. Apparently there's two still up, or if you've already participated, you can write about these. Uh, just again, if you decide to do the two that are still up, just remember that these are real researchers. Just take it seriously. They're usually fun, so have fun taking it. Um, I still remember doing something like this when I was an undergrad. <laughs> like I remember the studies I participated in because they were really fun. Um, and then you write a summary, really short, one page, double spaced. Um, so that's probably about like 500 words, if that, right? Um, so the topic of the study, uh, what did you have to do, basically? A reflection on your experience taking part in the study and why, you know? And then questions you might have about the study. What were they actually studying? How could I do a study like this? Something along those lines. And there are places on Blackboard to turn these in. All right. If you didn't get a chance to do for, uh, for studies or you just don't feel like being elaborate, no judgment, um, you can write up short papers, again, about the same length about recent research articles. Um, and so you do something very similar where you say the general topic of the study, what, would the, what was the method to what did these participants have to do? And then what do you think it would have been like to participate in that study and why? And then questions you have about the study. So don't let these slip through your mind. These are um, the really easy points, y'all. <laughs> Seriously, like article summary shouldn't take you very long at all. Each one's worth the same amount as a, uh, a perusal. So, all right. And then just a reminder for your poster of what we're looking for here. Um, so you either have a controversy or a myth in psychology. And these are the sections that are on that template that I'm looking for on the poster. So you start with an overview. What is the controversy or myth? Um, and then include arguments from both sides and have an example uh, from pop culture. So, you know, <laughs> if you're doing, um, hey Troy, you're an hour early for assessment. Just so you, know. <laughs> you want to go chill somewhere else. <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> um, so 
you know, could be like Jenny McCarthy talking about vaccines, right? Or, you know, think about those types of things, YouTube videos, memes. I think a couple of people have already mentioned doing memes here. Great example. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep, I mean, the template is really bare bones, and you all can do anything you want to it to jazz it up. So, including clip art, as long as it's you know relevant, obviously, um, changing the background, changing things like that. Yep, definitely. Then you're going to describe two cognitive biases that might impact understanding of your controversy or myth, and then two logical fallacies. And then you found these four articles, right? We have done these in class together. Uh, and so then you just have a section where you cover the major points of those studies. And then some sort of good visual representation of data related to the controversy or myth. And then um, your conclusion, you're going to provide an argument for where you fall about this controversy or myth. Is it true? Is it false? Is it maybe somewhere gray in between, right? Um, and then what data is supporting your position? And then lastly, I uh, have a couple of recommendations for how to address it or combat it. And we've talked a lot about fake news and all that good stuff. And then, like I said today, we're going to talk even more about the debunking and some of the effective ways to do this. So again, remember, let me um, actually pull up Blackboard and it'll make it a little easier to see everything. As you are, me, I know I need to type then talk, but I still try to do both at the same time. Um, <laughs> as you are doing this, you don't want giant blocks of text. Oops. on your poster. Um, think about sort of science fair posters or, you know, maybe even like a handout you would get a brochure in terms of putting uh, bullet points and things like that. So, um, so here is the poster template. It will have you open a copy like many of the things we've done this semester. Or you can just download the uh, PowerPoint as well. And so, you know, here again, kind of modeling this, right? You want bullet points that probably aren't much longer than each of these, right? So a sentence or so for each bullet point. Um, this means that you might want to like play with the fonts. Um, see, it's recommended that on a poster you don't go any smaller than 20. Just because, in theory, if we printed this, someone would have to look at it from maybe three feet away. But you gotta mess with your fonts and such there. But it means that as you're covering all this information, you want to be concise and efficient in how you cover it. And that honestly is one of the most challenging things about presenting science in general is that whether I'm doing a poster at a conference or I'm writing a manuscript, I have to try to present stuff clearly and concisely so that other people can get the gist, know that I actually you know, have something to back this up, right? I didn't just pull it out of nowhere. Um, but then also know that, um, you know, I, I've been, concise essentially and that's a challenge for me because i'm one of those people who were like could write all day <laughs> so all righty um, and then just to sort of show you where everything else is here's the place where you turn in your pecs um and just a quick reminder of what else is out there uh you know i still am posting the PowerPoint's here. I'll post the one for Wednesday, probably tomorrow sometime. Um, 
I'm still posting recordings of class. Uh, we'll have a review sheet for exam four up very shortly. Uh, and then uh, here are links and videos and then assignments. So this is a really nice place to go back and say, what assignments might I have missed? Maybe because I missed a class or something like that. They're all here. Uh, most of them have a place to turn it in right there. Um, and uh, then you can catch back up. And some of these, two or three of these are, are actually made to help you do your posting. So you get in-class assignment credit, and then you also are prepped for your poster. All right, any question about everything that's coming up? So during our final exam time, you're not taking a cumulative final. We're doing the presentations of these posters, okay? So exam four will be like exams one and two <laughs> within the hour. Um, and uh, it will be in class just like usual. Um, so, woohoo! And just to give you an idea of sort of what's where in terms of dates. Thank you, lovely Etsy person. Um, <laughs> so we are here, right? we're on the 29th. So then we have class on the 1st, the 3rd, and the 6th. And then I believe that Wednesday is a reading day and our exams not till, or our presentations, our exam period is until a week after that. So again, weird that we have that much time in between. Um, but does give you a little extra time if you haven't gotten your poster in on time. Thanks. Uh, yes, Imani, send me a reminder email. Thank you. Yes, and if anyone else has anything outstanding for me, please send me a reminder email um, because, you know, I'm supposed to be relaxing, right? But then your preschooler gets a double ear infection. So, you know. <laughs> things happen so uh, but the next couple of days I plan to be catching up on everything again all righty so with all that I am going to go ahead and get us back into our lecture here so we had just talked about health behaviors um, and now we are going to talk about happiness and well-being and so there is no right or wrong answer here. And folks in the chat, you can also feel free to comment. I've got you pulled up. So what is happiness to you? How do you know when you feel happy? What makes you happy? What is the subjective experience of happiness like? Like content. Content, yeah, that can be a huge one. Sometimes it's not about overwhelming joy. It's just like, this feels good. Mm -hmm. Right, it's hard. <laughs> it's a little hard. Yeah, I mean, like, some people will use metaphors, like, I remember when I was in my uh, Shakespeare class in college, I think it might have been love, but you could have used happiness here. But someone said, love is like a bowl of cereal. <laughs> like, what? But you know what? It made sense to that person. So yeah, it might be doing something you enjoy. It might be spending time with people that you enjoy. It might be a sense of accomplishment or reward. Oh, Casey has a great one here. When you look back and realize that was a great time. Yeah, sometimes you don't know what happiness is in the, in the moment, right? It might take you looking back to say, oh yeah, I was really happy, <laughs> right? Sometimes you don't realize it then. All right, well, let's think about well-being. What is well-being to you? Again, no way to wrong it. Not being sick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. You know, being free from illness, right? Maybe physical health 
So at least being in there that right everything's managed perhaps yeah i mean for some people well-being might be certain activities right like it might mean exercise or uh you know eating the like cdc plate thing right i don't know if you guys have seen this but it's like they've done away with the pyramid and now it's like a balanced plate um with veggies and fruits and grains and protein right and then what's subjective well-being and how might that differ from objective well-being exactly yeah so if we take, go back to your example of like a chronic illness right subjective well-being might be you just feel a little better, right? And objectively, your numbers at the doctor might not be that much better, but it's making a difference in your quality of life, right? Yeah, and sometimes mental health is a big issue here as well, right? In terms of subjective well being. So here is your textbook definition but subjective well being is an individual's self perceived interpretation of his or her quality of life at any particular point in time. So kind of very similar to what Debbie just said, how you are feeling about yourself. And you could be completely physically healthy, but be really struggling mentally or interpersonally, right? And so your subjective well-being would be totally off. I'll give you guys an example. Um, when I was postpartum, I've shared with you, I had postpartum depression and anxiety. And because of that, I lost a drastic amount of weight, um, which of course society always reads as good, right? Which in this case, it was not. Like I was losing chunks of my hair, like someone with anorexia, like it wasn't healthy. But people just looked at me from the outside and said, wow, you look great because I lost weight, right? But meanwhile, I was like anxious all the time and depressed and not being able to eat. Um, and so my subjective well-being definitely was different than what people were observing on the outside. And then happiness is an emotional state of well-being. So happiness is a feeling, right? And that's very different than a cognition or a thought. In, I think, particularly Western society and maybe particularly American society, we don't really understand emotions that well. <laughs> so if you ask someone how they're feeling, a lot of times they might answer you with a thought, right? Like, how are you feeling? Oh, well, I just really feel that so-and-so shouldn't have done such and such. That's not a feeling, right? That's a thought, right? A feeling would be, I'm really annoyed that so-and-so did such and such. But in America, we're not particularly good at that. So some of the other things that they talk about are the primacy and recency effect. We typically think about these when we think about something like missed learning, right? So if I give you a list of words right now, you would tend to remember more from the beginning, that's called the primacy effect, and more from the end, and that's called the recency effect. And there's a whole like curve of forgetting in terms of how many you remember from the start, and then it's sort of really dropping off, and then how many you remember at the end. But this also applies to just general things in our lives, right? And this goes back to some of the stuff we've talked about with fake news and misinformation and how hard it is to change it, right? If we learn something incorrectly, it is really hard to change our thoughts or our opinions because of the primacy effect. Right. So we can think about people who really struggle to reshape, reform their opinions, even when presented with really compelling evidence. Right. Or we can think about this in terms of bad relationships. It doesn't even have to be that, you know, you're in something where it's really bad, like abusive. Right. It could just be this relationship is not good for you. 
and maybe now it's not good for the other person, but because it was great at the beginning, you just keep trucking along. Oh, it's, it's so great. We love each other so much. Meanwhile, like you don't speak to each other. <laughs> You're just annoyed with each other, right? The recency effect um, can affect, again, how we interact with the daily lives of, you know, remembering things that happen more recently, and that can sort of negate a history of things, right? So, for example, maybe you really don't like a particular politician, uh, you know, public figure, what have you, but then they do something really great for a cause you really care about, you might just sort of, and again, we're not doing it on purpose, but you might kind of forget everything else they've done that you hate, right? Same thing in a relationship. Maybe you've been treating each other awfully, but you have like one really great date night. <laughs> so you're like, oh, it's perfect, right? And, uh, you know, maybe not. So these can really affect us as well. And essentially what happens is the primacy effect, whatever you learn first has more time to like settle in your mind, right? If it's something as simple as word list learning, you've had more time to rehearse it, right? So that gets set and that's hard to change. And recency effects, it's like, you know, this is what just happened, so it's fresh in my mind. And obviously those two can work together to reinforce each other as well. Like again, this relationship started out so great and we recently just had a really nice date and it's perfect. And you, again, forget all the times you just like disagree with each other about everything fundamentally. We've also talked about a couple other things here. So hedonic adaptation is adjustment to events affecting happiness. Such that the events lose their influence over happiness level. So like when you first get a job offer, you get really excited, really glad, you know, again, especially like in the economy as it has been since like 09, right? But once you get into the job, right, you find out like all jobs, there are some pitfalls, and you just aren't as into it and don't feel as excited or grateful about that job. You know, and so sometimes it takes some perspective, right, to take a step back and reanalyze that. And then the hedonic treadmill is adaptation to happy life events so that more material possessions are continually required for happiness. And this happens a lot, again, in Western culture, in particular, in capitalized capitalist societies, that happiness is equated with things, right? So it's like, oh, I gotta have the next car, the next house, the next handbag, what have you. Um, and in fact, that isn't always making you happy at all, right? But like somehow in your mind, you've gotten that idea. Um, I saw a great tweet the other day that said my favorite activity is or my favorite new activity i think is um online shopping for hours and then closing the tabs without buying anything <laughs> right? like that's what i up in that too because i used to just be that person that would just buy everything all the time and you know within reason within our means and now i'm like do i really need that no right that's not going to make me happy it's just going to be another thing to take up space so so in terms of what is the antidote to all these things that get in the way of our happiness? So they talk about the invisible threads of connections to others as important contributions to happiness. Um, relationships are a lot of what matters to us humans. Humans are pack animals, just like wolves or elephants or horses. Uh, we are happiest when we have relationships with others that are healthy, right? We don't want those that are not beneficial to us. Uh, it's the quality, not the quantity. So it doesn't matter if you have thousands of friends on social media, right? It's do you have a couple people you can go to when you're having a really crappy day, right? Whether those are friends, family, what have you. 
Um, what seems to matter most is relationship satisfaction, um, and that's independent of income. So you can be a billionaire and be happy based on your research, your satisfaction, or you can be barely scraping by and be happy based on your relationship satisfaction. Uh, and optimism and happiness are related to self-perceived health and happiness. So that subjective well-being is really tied to those things. So it's much more helpful again, to be looking for those satisfying, mutual, non-abusive, uh, aggressive, harmful relationships. Um, so they think that relationships and being optimistic may contribute to not only positive perceptions of well-being and health, but also because we know there's a mind-body connection these are actually linked to actual physical, for example. So there are reasons why people who are more optimistic after a cancer diagnosis actually do better because that optimism drives them and a lot of it has to do with adherence to routine, things like that, right? Again, we know that correlation doesn't equal causation. But there is no reliable correlation between money and happiness, right? So we definitely know that's not causal. Um, so positive emotions are a big thing. Um, optimism, and then this is something you all might have heard, particularly with Thanksgiving being last week. But more and more within the mental health field, research is showing, and a lot of therapists are implementing this: the idea that expressing gratitude. Uh, to others, but also just for what you have is really beneficial um, to you as an individual. Uh, and then spending money on experiences helps more than things. And so this is maybe vacations or concerts or social events, or it doesn't have to be anything except that it costs any money at all, right? You can have a very cold right now, right? <laughs> with a friend, <laughs> and it's great. Uh, I'll give you an example. So um, a friend of mine who used to be head of the writing center here, which is a different college, and she was back on campus the last day before break, and we sat outside so we didn't have to have our masks on for like two hours and just chatted, right? And like that made us both really happy, right? So it doesn't even have to cost money. Um, we also have tried to work on ways to help people get off that hedonic treadmill, right? Not focus so much on material things. Um, so what they found is that hedonic adaptation can be reduced by continually, uh, continuing to frequently think about and pay attention to positive changes in our lives. Uh, so even if they're small, right? Just like Today, I did a little better than I have in the past, right? That's great. Today, I remembered to bring in the document I needed to make photocopies for my class. Sounds silly, right? But like, that can be a victory. All right, so all semester we've been talking about scientific literacy, right? As opposed to science literacy. But we can also have psychological literacy, which you probably all picked up on already. So this is understanding psychological knowledge and applying the principles of psychological science to the challenges uh, in your own life. Those could be just within yourself, personal. Those could be in your interactions with other people, social. But it can be broader, it can be community, right? So. You know, there's a lot of work being done now, particularly by psychologists from traditionally underrepresented populations um, about community-based research. So not only do they involve their participants in the design and execution and interpretation of a study, but they also design those studies with the idea in mind that they will be improving something within the community, 
that there will be a positive change made, right? So thinking about application, right? And to be perfectly honest, even psychological scientists are not always the best at this, right? Sometimes we get really bogged down in the theory or the particulars or the minutia of our data, right? But more and more therapists, those designing prevention programs, those working in educational centers, are trying to take psychological knowledge and apply it, right? And in fact, for some of the journals I publish in, you have to have a section in your discussion at your study that says, this is how it can be applied. And if you don't have that, they make you write. Because <laughs> they're like, it doesn't matter unless this, we can figure out how this can help to better people, right? And better people's lives. We talked about this in justification last chapter, just because I felt it fit there, but your book thought it fit here, so I thought I'd circle back around to it. The system justification is our defense and justification of the status quo. We like things to stay the way they are because it's easy, right? And this is just a human tendency. And we do this even when it may not be advantageous to ourselves, and in fact, even if it's disadvantageous to ourselves, we will often defend the status quo. And this may help to explain, for example, why people sometimes seem to vote against their own interests, right? So, you know, again, people from traditionally underrepresented groups or genders that you think wouldn't jive with certain ideas may Vote for people who seem to espouse opinions that are directly in, in contradiction, right? Or would directly harm that person. Um, I think of, you know, people who are um, working class and, uh, you know, a certainly lower class, even though we don't like to use that term, um, who vote for political people who will cut all social funding, right? Because they think, well, you know, no one should get that, right? When they don't even realize they might be benefiting from it or their neighbor might be. Sometimes this is because we identify with the candidate in other important ways, right? There's something about them that speaks to us. Um, and sometimes it's just not realizing our own status. So for my uh, women's and gender studies class this semester, we did a reading about how people classify themselves. And it's like the vast majority, I'm not gonna remember percentages, but I wanna say over 60 or over 70% of people who would be classified as working class say that they're middle class or upper middle class, right? Because no one wants to think of themselves as impoverished. Um, it's just like when we talked about in here about people rating themselves as above average, <laughs> same idea. And so they might be thinking of themselves in that way and therefore kind of not cognitively letting themselves realize that they will be harmed by some of these other policies. So this is just, again, a brainstorming, no right or wrong answer, but what do you think? What kind of questions do you think psychology or psychological literacy would help us answer. And these could be sweeping giant questions or they could be tiny little things that might benefit some of those. And again, uh, Zoom folks, feel free to put stuff in the chat. I'll bring it up. So I'll give you an example to kick it off, right? One of the things, sort of one of the growing areas in psychology is environmental psychology, right? The idea of looking at how climate affects people psychologically, but then also sort of the flip of like, how do we get people to make changes or to even believe right, that there's a climate crisis going on in globalization. Mm 
Another example of another growing area, gerotypology. It was um, a study and focus on people who are older, right? This is a very growing area of the field because of the aging baby owners. Um, and so they are doing things like trying to figure out ways to help delay or prevent dementia of Alzheimer's disease, right? Um, so from that, you may remember hearing about this like maybe 15 years ago, I think it came out, the idea that like, you should be doing Sudoku or crossword puzzles and like working out your brain is as important as working out your body. Um, and that research came from neuropsychologists right? and neuropsychologists. Or it can be something as simple and small. Uh, yes, Will says why people think and behave the way they do. Exactly. Trying to just figure out your family members sometimes, right? Like why the heck are they doing that? Or politicians, or uh, the administration of a university, <laughs> things along those lines, right? Or psychology and psychological literacy can help you with things that are really small in the grand scheme of things, but may not seem small to you. Help you develop studying techniques, right? Help you figure out things like attentional issues you might be having and how to address those. Okay, so there's lots of different big and small questions that psychology can help us answer. And obviously I'm super biased since I'm a psychologist, right? But it really is a field that seeks to help improve a lot of things um, and in a lot of different ways. Uh, so some examples of the antidote here. Um, so Again, behavior change techniques in a lot of areas. Uh, we talked about those with the health behaviors right before break, right? Uh, this is also true in therapy, right? Therapy is often focused not only on thoughts and emotions, but behaviors and changing those behaviors. Uh, so sometimes it's just getting people to notice the behaviors they're engaging in. I think about, um, I've never treated someone with this, but one of my good friends in grad school did, there's a disorder called trichotillomania, where stress-related, impulse control-related, you'll pull out your own hair. Um, and most of the time, they don't realize they're doing it in the moment. And so when my friend was implementing therapy for this, for this person, a lot of what you do in session with the client is just like pointing out when their hand starts to go their hair, for example. It's like they just don't realize it. Um, and so we need to think about long-term things, right? So they give us an example of like lofty marketing claims and short-term success in weight loss programs. Um, most people who lose weight in weight loss programs gain it back and then some, right? Like, Diets do not work by any stretch of the imagination. And the fact that like we have this multi-billion dollar industry that is, you know, like basically scamming people every year, right, is really disturbing. And yet, because people have been told that it is their fault, that there's something wrong with them, that's why they're overweight, they keep trying to change it. When in fact there are larger systemic and even genetic issues, right? Why some people will never be a size four, and that's okay, right? So sort of thinking about what are long-term things we can do to help people make changes that might make a difference in their health. So maybe you just need to lower your blood pressure. What can you do to do that, right? And let's not focus what it says on the scale. Um, so one of the things they talked about is making public commitments. Um, so a meta-analysis found that if you make something like an environmental pledge, you're more likely to maintain those behavioral changes. Um, and so uh, if you're doing something intensive and really committing to it, that might make a change as well. Personally, like 
you know, people start listing what their weight loss goals and like other people can identify with that. And like because you have put that out there to other people, it may push you to continue like going about. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So sort of posting about those things or sharing them more openly with friends and family, asking them to help hold you accountable. Yeah, and it can be something as simple as like self-care, right? Going to the pool to relax or going to the pool to swim for health, right? Or it can be something more elaborate, right? Like based on the fact that I've discovered I have, you know, diabetes, for example, I need to make these dietary changes in order to like keep all my limbs. Like I don't know how familiar people are with particularly type one diabetes. Um, if it's out of balance, you can, you know, like lose toes and things like that. Not pleasant. So modeling is a huge thing we know from behavioral psychology. This is watching what other people do and learning by that. So like we don't we don't have to go and you know drive into things or eat random junk, right? To know like that's not something we need to be doing. <laughs> we just we watch things like Fear Factor and Jackass, right? Like <laughs> we learn by watching that, like, cool, that's not something I need to do, right? And it can be smaller, right? You know, changing behavior through observing other people, right? So we do this with our friends, our family without even realizing it. Um, and we do it as kids, right? We model the behavior of those around us. And then making those long-term changes in behaviors affecting our lives and health and our communities and cultures is really important. But again, it requires us to pull on psychological science in order to be able to do so. All right. So the other thing that you had in your perusal reading for this section was the debunking handbook, uh, which talks about misinformation, right? And this is what we've been keep coming back to all semester, just because I think this is one of the critical issues of our time that psychology may be able to help us with, right? So we know that we need to change misinformation because of how problematic it is, right? We know it can do damage. All these folks who are unfortunately dying, right? Days or weeks after professing, I don't need to get the COVID vaccine, right? That's heartbreaking in some ways. Um, it can be really sticky. So again, thinking about that primacy effect and how hard it is to undo once we've learned something incorrectly. So we wanna try and preempt it if possible, right? We wanna try and get correct information to people. This is why it's so infuriating, right? When school districts insist on teaching incorrect information to kids or omitting large parts of American history because they're uncomfortable, right? The fact that like Thanksgiving was this happy meeting between the pilgrims and the Native Americans, like no. <laughs> The pilgrims were white supremacists, right? And like this whole thing started off years of genocide and things like that. And this is why uh, people of American Indian, Native American, First Nations people celebrate Thanksgiving as a day of mourning and remembrance, right? So we want to debunk it often and properly. And sometimes, which I don't think this handbook got into as much, but how we try to contradict it with people is almost more important than the contradicting itself, right? So here's some de definitions from this section of your reading. None of these should be a big surprise, but misinformation is that false information that is um, disseminated. And sometimes it's meant to mislead, right? Like those people at Fox News who tell people the vaccine is going to kill them, they're all vaccinated, right? So you start to wonder, is there something malicious there, right? And that's true of politicians as well, right? But sometimes it's just people spreading stuff on social media because it sounds interesting, right? And so they're not intending to mislead, but that happens. Disinformation is when you're deliberately trying to mislead people, 
And sometimes people do this as a joke, and sometimes people have a philosophical or political agenda behind this. We've talked about fake news, um, seems to mimic news media content, and unfortunately, uh, the mainstream media can get sucked into it, right? Particularly in this era where a lot of the stories that they have seem to come from Twitter, right? Or other social media sites. The continued influence effect is the keeping of relying on inaccurate information in your memory and reasoning again, even after someone has said, no, this is wrong and this is wrong. And sometimes this is again, stubbornness or really clinging to that belief for ideological reasons. And sometimes this is just the primacy effect. That's so really hard to change something once we've learned it. And then the illusory truth effect goes back to our idea of illusory correlations from earlier in the semester that repeated information is more likely to be judged true than novel information because it becomes familiar. This is why political candidates will throw signs up everywhere. They're hoping that just like by remembering you their name, you're more likely to vote for them. Or in local elections, no joke, the person that tends to win is the person whose name is first on the ballot because people don't do their research. And they're just like, I don't know that person. <laughs> Problematic, right? Make sure you research for local elections. Uh, yeah, I think I can get through this in two minutes. Let's see. <laughs> um, so we've got misinformation, right? Sometimes it's expected, right? We know, okay, this is going to be misinterpreted, maybe by certain groups. So we try to pre bunk or inoculate against misinformation providing warning and explaining the misleading techniques people are using. If it's already out there, you know, we need to think about the visibility. If it's largely unknown, uh, we want to just sort of monitor, keep an eye on it, but mm, it has some traction. Uh, is the framing kind of changing here and there? We've seen this with vaccines, right? It was all oh, of the CDC and approve them. Now they're approved. It's like, oh, they were approved too fast, right? Like, what do you want, right? If the framing is fixed, then you just debunk it over and over and over again. You want to lead with the facts. You want to talk about the myth, talk about the fallacy, and end with the facts. So we'll spend just a couple more minutes. We only have two more slides on Wednesday, finishing this up, and then we will uh, go ahead and move to our last chapter. So have a good couple days and I will see you then.